Hi, welcome to this Lero series of lectures on data manipulation. Uh, this one is going to concentrate on data manipulation spreadsheets and specifically we're going to be using Excel to illustrate our points. Uh, it's titled The Engineering of Spreadsheets. My name is Jim Buckley. I'm a lecturer in the Computer Science and Information Systems Department at the University of Limerick and I'm also a researcher in Lero, the Irish Software Research Centre in the University of Limerick. Um, it's in my capacity of both of these that I'm presenting this lecture and really in my long-term interest in the power and the destructive power, destructive capability of spreadsheets. So I think they're phenomenally powerful, but I also think they can be phenomenally destructive when errors creep in. So this lecture is really going to be focused on how we might use their power and how we might limit the potential of their... So I'm going to start off with a little bit of motivation to show you how powerful, how destructive spreadsheets can be. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the example we'll use as a running example throughout this tutorial or presentation. Uh, I'm going to use it to show a potential structuring of spreadsheets that I think is powerful and uh, allows people to better find errors, etc., cetera, um, organize it better. And I'm also going to look at useful data manipulation features in Excel uh, via this worked example. So we're going to walk through this worked example showing useful data manipulation features. These are features that these are features that I found as the most important features in Excel on various different spreadsheets, but also one or two features that my wife, who's a long-term admin worker, um, said were particularly useful and I shouldn't leave out, so thank you, Bert. Um, uh, and then finally, I'm going to end up with some best practice error checking strategies from software engineering that could be allowed, applied when you're developing your spreadsheets or when you're error checking your spreadsheets. Okay. So let's move on to the motivation section. So when I think of spreadsheets I've developed, typically it's been for some repeated need, like my end of year statistics, my end of term grades or something like that, that I need to do over and over again. And I, I think to myself, well, God, if I, could, if I had a spreadsheet for this, I could just put in the data and get all the, all the results out I needed, and that would save me time every time I need to return to this report or this end of year stats uh, report. Um, so that implies a few things. It implies that I'm trying to find a shortcut, which implies that I'm under pressure. It also implies that I'm willing to take the pain of ramping up and creating a spreadsheet so that the shortcut is there forevermore, which means that during my short-term preparation, I'm going to be even more rushed for time. Uh, so there's a need, but there is limited time capacity. It's usually done in, under some sort of pressure. Um, and many people who do this aren't formally trained in developing software. And developing a spreadsheet is sort of like developing software. Most notably, it's very like programming in that spreadsheets are very unforgiving. They need precise, unambiguous specifications. And if you get that slightly wrong, you'll probably get an error. And that brings us down to the first consequence down below, which is that spreadsheets are error prone and very error prone. So I'm, I'm just gonna give you two examples of that. Um, Okay, so here's the first one. This is an article by Crawl and Butler, which details a spreadsheet. Um, well, it details their concerns about errors in spreadsheets, and it illustrates them using a pediatric an anesthetic spreadsheet. So this is a spreadsheet that's publicly available that allows you to calculate the anesthetic you should give a child of a certain weight with its various constituents. And they detail all the errors that are in that spreadsheet. Well, they detail a lot of the errors that are in that spreadsheet. And um, I, I, obviously the consequences of that are fairly huge if it were to be used in medical practice with, with the errors that are in it. Um, so that's, that's one example. Um, another example is work that we did in UL actually in Nero, um, where we were looking at HSE spreadsheets and for an admittedly very small sample of about 11 or 12 spreadsheets, we found that 90% of the spreadsheets that were used administratively, not clinically, um, contained bottom line errors that caused the reporting that they were doing up the line to be incorrect. And the average cell error rate was 13%. That means that for every one in every eight cells, there was a small error happening. So that, that shows that spreadsheets are very error prone. And it's not surprising given this lack of training that most developers have and the time constraints under which they're working. Um, 
Another problem is that if, if I develop a spreadsheet, say for my students' end of term results, I go, well, Chris, JJ, Mike, they'd all need that. I might, I should send it around. They could find it useful too. So I'll probably send it to them. And they'll probably send it to several other people based on it being useful. And then two months later, I find an error in my spreadsheet. And I go, oh, I better fix that. And I fix it. Then about two weeks later, I think to myself, oh, you know what? I sent that, I sent that spreadsheet out to a few other people. Who did I send it to? And that's quite easy to check. I just check my email and look at who I emailed it around to. But then each of them has to go through the same realization and try and find out who they spread it to. So the consequence of that is that it can be hard to rectify the errors in all copies of the spreadsheets if and when they are found. So you, you, you get this picture of very error prone spreadsheets circulated and error prone around the community. Um, and that coupled with the fact that important decisions are made based and important reporting is made based on spreadsheet confidence often leads to serious consequences. So let's look at the consequences. Um, this is a site called EU Sprig. It's a special interest group um, talking about spreadsheets and it just details the sort of problems that spreadsheets have caused. Um, the first one is a nice example. Um, so at first the retail retailers said profits would be 20% lower than the 70 million expected by the city with 5.2% million of the 14 million hole that has opened up in its forecast down to a spreadsheet error. 5.2 million down to a spreadsheet error. Um, the next thing that's noticeable about um, this page is the size of the scroll bar. So you can see that there is an awful lot of uh, these um, spreadsheet errors. Uh, oof, uh, I don't even want to stop on them, but they, they, there are hundreds and hundreds of spreadsheet error stories and often they have millions and millions of consequences. An interesting spreadsheet, an interesting website to visit, I think. Um, so that's the motivation. Or as Gilbert, or as Gilbert puts it, Gilbert, sorry, Gilbert puts it. Uh, there's a nice cartoon. I'll let you read it for yourself. Okay, so hopefully now I've convinced you that there is a problem here. Spreadsheets can be very error prone. They can be distributed and those errors can be distributed with them and very hard to rectify and important decisions and important reporting is made based on spreadsheet contents. There are serious consequences to these errors. So with that motivation, let's go on to what we're going to cover today. So we're going to use a running example. And as I'm a lecturer, I wanted to pick something that I was fairly familiar with. Uh, so I picked that end of term exam results example that I had earlier. So I'm saying this is for a module called a fic fictitious example called Responsible Digital Citizenship for semesters 1920, semester one. And in it, I put in student ID numbers, all fake, student surnames and forenames, all fake, and our four courses. These are actually real courses. So we've in UL, of course, in, in computer systems, we have computer systems course, a digital media course, a games course, and a music media technology course. Um, now I assess my students in this fictitious course via three means. I give them a midterm, which is reported on in column E, and that's out of 30. I give them a practical, and that's out of 20. And I give them a final exam, which is out of 100. And you can see the dates there. Um, now, of course, I have to come back with the result out of 100. So the practical is going to keep being marked out of 20. The midterm, I'm marking really out of 15, so that's got to be divided by two. And the final exam, I'm marking out of 65, so that has to be divided by 100, multiplied by 65, or divided by 10 and multiplied by 6.5. Um, so I, here is where I do those analysis to get their total marks. And then I get their grade. So based on the total marks. So you see this guy got 55. Guy, yeah, Mike, um, sorry. Um, and you see that a C1 is between 52 and 56. So he's a C1. Um, so that's an output. 
Often I get asked for um, references for my ex-students, so I find it very useful to have their ranking in the class. I can say, oh yeah, um, Anthony was a very good student. He came fourth in the top tenth, top tenth of the class. Very good. Often I want to um, email the students with a query, so I have a field here where I take their ID number and concatenate on at studentmail.ul.ie. So that's, um, that's their email address. Uh, I want to see the average grade, or sorry, average mark by each cohort to see if there's one particular cohort that's struggling more than others. Um, I want to get the day's distance between the midterm and the practical because UL has a regulation where you can't have more than, you can't have less than 20 working days between a midterm and the practical. That's fictitious, but um, I just made it up for my purposes. Um, and in administration, they want the mean, the standard deviation, and the median for each assessment technique and for the overall mark. So I report those as well. Uh, finally, administration also wants a diagram to show the spread of marks to make sure that I'm not too easy or too hard a marker. So I also have to create a, a diagram in there and to show my breakdown of marks and how many people got how many grades. Uh, so that's the example. We're going to start off with the input, the stuff that's in black here, the data that we start off with. And then we're going to work through the intermediate results to the actual output that we need for reporting to um, administration and for my references, for my email contacts. So that seems kind of clear. Um, the first thing I want to point out um, is the different structuring we have here. So I've tried to impose a structuring based on where they are and colors. You'll notice that all the data I put in is in black. All the intermediate results I have are in gray and all the outputs are in blue. And they're all distant from each other. So data, intermediate results in the middle, outputs to the right and down at the bottom here. Um, so I call that the DIO model, which is data, intermediate and output. I know that other people have called it different things, but essentially it's about partitioning the, the spreadsheet into different parts so that they, they're partitioned so that it breaks down the complexity of it. So here we've broken it down based on the data, the intermediate results and the outputs. But often there are two or three sections and people break down uh, two or three functionalities within the one spreadsheet and people also choose to break down it based not just on data, intermediate results and outputs, but on each functionality as well. And of course you can use different sheets for that. Okay, so as the last slide in this um, introductory part, I'm going to talk about the features or I'm just going to list the features that we're going to discuss in Excel. These are them. I'm not going to walk them or talk them out one by one, but this is just to give you a feel for if you're interested in staying with the lectures for the rest of the course, if these, if this sort of, if these sort of facilities are useful to you. Um, so the rest of the session is going to be about these facilities and a few hints from software engineering and how best to error check your spreadsheet. I'm just minimizing this part. Okay, so here's where I started off. You'll see I've just got my data input. I've put in the ID numbers, surnames, forenames, their course. Um, I've put in the midterm results. I've put in the practical results. I've put in the final exam results. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to do a count to see if everyone has submitted all assessment materials. Um, it's easy to see here that these guys have in inputted all three, but this guy's only input one. But if I have a lot of assessment materials or, you know, rolling averages over 12 months or over two years over months, then it can be a bit harder to spot that a cell is empty. So I'm just going to make sure that I've got three assessment materials for everyone. So I'm going to use a count all or count A, and that'll count the number of cells in the following range. So I'm interested in the range of, that's it for you there, that makes it easier. So let's copy all that down. And now we've got three in most rows, but we've got one here. So that's, that looks like it's kind of right. And highlights how easy it is to make errors in spreadsheets. 
So, yeah, so I see that this guy is only one assessment, Anthony, and that was because I know he was sick during uh, the midterm and for the practical, so I'm going to have to judge him just on his final year grade. Okay, um, now, as I mentioned before, this totals up to 150. We don't want to total up to 150. We want the midterm to only count for 15%, so instead of marked out at 30, we want to mark out at 15, so we'll just divide it by two. Uh, equals e seven divided by two yeah. equals e five e five divided by two and you get three point five which is half of seven which is what we'd expect so let's copy that all the way down and let's just pick a random one this one here we see that we look at the formula, it's E30, which is exactly like we'd expect, E30. And it's half of it, 14. So that's good. Okay, final exam. Here we want to take G5 and we want to divide it by 10 and multiply it by 6.5 or divide it by 100 and multiply it by 6.5, 65. Okay, so equals, let's use some brackets just to be very clear about ordering, uh, G5 divided by 100 multiplied by 65. And that gives us 32. And let's do that all the way down. Let's see if there's any, there's a whole number there, so that should be an easy one to test. So here we had 40. Divide by 100 is 0.4, multiply by 65. Well, let's divide it by 10, gives us four, multiply it by 6.5 is 24 and 226. So that seems to be right. Yeah, okay. So now we've got all the data we need to get our total mark. We've got midterm, final exam, and a practical. So this is out of 15, this out of 65, so that gives us out of 80, and this gives us out of 20. So now we're on to our next uh, Excel function, which is sum. sum. And the sum in this case is um, J5 for the midterm, and K5 for the final year exam, and F5. That gives us 54. Um, so, 54. We've got to do some error checking on that. So, 32 plus 3 is 35, plus 18 is 45, 63, um, uh, 64.325. Sorry. 35, 45, 53, 53, 54.325. So we see this has been rounded down. We don't really want to round it down because we're, I'm a benevolent lecturer. So I want my students to do well under me. So I'm going to round that up. Um, so this roundup says that if you're going to um, round it at all, it goes to the higher result, not to the lower result. And I want to round it up to um, uh, not positions decimally, so to the nearest whole number. So that should change that to 55. Yeah, so now I feel I'm not doing anyone a disservice here by, you know, giving the guy who got 54.495, just 54. Go to round them up to 55. Okay. So that's done for all the students then. Okay. Except for this guy here, who actually is just going to get his exam result because he was sick for the other two. So instead, I'm going to put 45 in here. Okay. So 45 is in there because I just want assessment. Okay. So now we've got concat A, sum and roundup done. Now I'm going to move on to the emails, show you how to use concatenation. So what we want to do here is take the ID number 
and add on the UL specific email address. So we're going to do equals concatenation, concatenate, sorry, um, and it's cell A5. And what I'm going to concatenate it on is at student email dot ul dot ie and there I get the student mails address I'm just checking the last one there I see that the ID number here with at student mail dot ul dot ie contains the student mail um, on the other side uh, okay, so now we've reached, we've got our student email address done. Now we just want to check that UL requirement that there is enough time between practical and midterm. So, midterm to next assessment days. Well, we're going to do it approximately first. We're going to look at the days between the practical date and the midterm date. So the practical date is in F4. And the midterm date is in P4. I should have put a days in there. Okay, so that tells us there are 26 days between the 20th of the 10th and the 15th of the 11th. Note that in days we put the bigger date or the most recent date in first and we take away the other date from it. Okay, that doesn't really tell us how many work days they were supposed to have. So um, let's go uh, and use a function called network days. Days you can network or work days. And again, we use the same two cells, but this time, interestingly enough, we have to reverse them uh, to get a positive number. So we start with E4 and then F4. So that's a bit inconsistent between days and network days. And it gives us 20 days. So we have the minimum number of days, 20 days, four weeks between the practical and the midterm. So we're good. Okay. So average ifs, sum ifs, min ifs, and max ifs. Now, if you're looking at the, at the PowerPoint slides, you'll see average ifs, sum ifs, mimfs. Um, so I typed that in wrong. You should just correct that. It's M-I-N-I-F-S, not M-I-M-F-S. Um, okay. So how are we going to use this? Well, here we want to see the average score for computer systems. So we want to really say, I want to get the average score of each system, of each student that's in computer systems. So I want this average, this score to count, but not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, this average score to count. So I only want to average the scores for comp sys students. So how do I do that? Well, I use the average if function. The average ifs function. And the first thing it takes is what we're looking for the average of. So we're looking for the average of their scores. So it's um, L5. Colon L45. So that's what we're looking for, this, their scores. Um, now we're saying we're only looking, we're only interested in those scores if the values in D5 to 45. So D5 colon D45, only if they're equal to the value that's in R5 which is computer systems. So let me just put in R5. And that gives us the average of just computer systems students. So just to go over that again, because it's a little complicated, we're looking for the average marks, so we have to give the range of marks, but we're only interested in average marks when whatever is in column D5 to 45 is comp sys. And that average if function allows it. They're the marks. There's the place we're looking for our condition. It has to be computer systems in D5 to D45. And what are we looking for in D5, D45? We're looking at the value that's in R5, computer systems. Okay. 
Let's cut and paste that, or copy and paste it down here. And we see we get an average of 57.4444. So it seems like the game students are doing a bit better than the computer system students. But if we look at how that formula is made up, we see a little problem. We aren't looking at L5 to L45 anymore. We're looking at L9 to L49. That's because we've moved this four cells down. So the values referred to are moved four cells down. One, two, sorry, one, two, three, four, L9. So we didn't really want that. So how can we make the formula, how can we make the cells referred to stay absolute? We want them to always be L5 to L45. Let's go back up here and change it a bit. Let's put a dollar in before the L, and a dollar in before the five, and a dollar in before the L, and a dollar before the 45. So we want to always refer to this, L5 to L45. We want the condition to always refer to D5 to D45. So we're going to have to do the same thing here. Dollar D, dollar five, dollar D, dollar 45. And you'll notice, um, and we keep the R5 the same because we want to refer to one cell up and one cell across. Here we want to refer to one cell up and one cell across to filter on games. Okay, you see that the result doesn't change any, but now when we copy it down here, we won't end up with 57.44. We'll end up with 55.909 because it's based on L5 to L45 and the value in D5 to D45 being R9 games. So now we can paste it in here and we can paste it in here. Okay, um, so there's a, there's a lot of functions like that. For example, if we just cut and paste this or copy this over here, um, you see now we're referring to S5 rather than R5. So we need to change that to R5 but we can change the formula to sum ifs. So this doesn't give us the average result for computer science students, but the sum of all results for computer science students. Not particularly relevant in this case, but more important if you're determining maybe profit for a product. Um, and you see that in total, they got 566 points, which considering there are 11 computer system students, if you multiply that by 11, you get 566. Um, so it's, it's true. Uh, I'm going to, because it's irrelevant, I'm going to delete that. I don't really want it, just to show you that it exists. Sorry, let's just do this. Okay. Uh, I've also referred to minifs and maxifs in the PowerPoint presentation. Unfortunately, my, my version of Excel is pre-2019, so I don't have that capability. And um, those functions only came onto versions of Excel in 2019 or Excel 365. Um, min ifs gives us the minimum score of any computer science student. Maxif will give us the maximum score of any computer science student. Again, useful functions, but not things that I can show you here because I don't have that, that function in my version of Excel. Okay, so we'll do two more and then uh, I'll take a little break. Okay, so the next row we're talking about rank. So this is because uh, people who want references, typically I like to be able to give them evidence of how well the student did in my class. So the rank just says how well the student did over all the students. So it's how good this score is compared to all the other scores. So the formula is rank um, L5, the score we want to compare and the range we want to compare it to L5 to L45. So we see that he came 20th out of um, 45 students or 40 students. Uh, now we could copy this down, but we're going to have exactly the same problem again. So you see here we're using, because we didn't put in our dollars, we're referring to L9 and L45 rather than L6 and L5 to L45. So let's change this formula. We still want to refer to the cell opposite us to get the student's particular ranking, but we want to change this to be absolute. So these don't change as we drag, drag our formulas around. Dollar L, dollar five, dollar L, dollar 45. See the result stays the same, but now the 31, 20, 34, and four will change. Okay. 
So let's just drag that all the way down. So here, for example, we see that we are referring to L45, as we should be, because that's the score we're trying to compare. But we're still comparing it to all the scores from L45 to L5, because we've got the dollars in. OK, so we can see if I'm ever asked to write a reference for Anthony, he came fourth in the class. I can see he was in the top 10% of the class. Um, not so good for the fictitious grace, unfortunately. OK, so let's just go across here a little. now. Um, admin in UL demands that I report the mean, the standard deviation, and median for all my assessments. So for the practical, the midterm, and the end of year assessment, I've got to calculate the mean. But that's easily done. I just use the average function, and I just say L5 to L45. Me the average. Uh, likewise, for standard deviation equals standard deviation L5. And the median um, is likewise median. Five colon L45. Okay, so now I've got those three, and um, we can just copy them across because well, this one refers to L5 to L45, the next one should refer to F5 to, L, to F45, and the next one should refer to G5 to G45. Ah, M5. Sorry, I don't know where I got L from. <laughs> this should be E5 T45. I suppose it does show how you should always check what you're referencing. So Excel does a very nice uh, capability in terms of showing what you're referencing in your formulas. Uh, I'll have to change these as well, I guess. E5, 45. And five. Okay, um, you notice I'm getting little consistency warnings here, which are always interesting. And in this case, the formula omits, omits an adjacent cell, so that's why it's worried. So I'm okay with that. Um, again, I'll copy across here, and it works a bit better this time. Works a bit better this time. Works a bit better this time. I'm also going to copy, cut, copy, and do that for the full results. So um, that's average, mean, and standard deviation. So we've got about halfway through all of Excel's capabilities. Um, I'll um, so I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit because I notice it's 10 to 1 and I don't want to keep you too late and I also want to get to the, to the um, software engineering hints in terms of error checking. One thing you should have noticed already is that there's, I've, I've already committed a lot of errors. So um, it's, it's, it's very easy to introduce errors into spreadsheets. Okay, so now a really nice function of Excel, um, which is the VLOOKUP. And essentially what it does is it says, I'm going to look up a table for this value and report another value based on this value. So if we go down through the spreadsheet, we see that this is the table where we've got marks in column one and grades in column two. So if our mark is between 52 and 56, then the mark will be a C1. That's what will come back from the lookup function. So we have to give it where this table is. We have to tell it which row to pluck to come back from and which row to inspect, okay? So VLOOKUP gives us that. So equals VLOOKUP, the V refers to vertical table and the lookup value is L5. So we're looking up L5, the student score, and we're looking it up in the table um, that's placed at dollar A, dollar 53 to 
$B$64. And VLOOKUP automatically looks in the first column for whatever is in L5. And we've got to tell it which column to come back with. So we want it to come back with column two. So we want it to come back, yeah, so that works out as C1. So it looked up 55, it saw it fell in this range here, so it came back with a C1. And likewise, we can do that for all students because we put in our dollars. And you'll see here, for example, that 40 is a C3. Yep, 40 is a C3, so that's good. We seem to, we seem to have that correct as well. Okay, um, so once we've got these grades, we want to count how many um, students fall into each grade. So let's do that here. We'll use a count, uh, C-O-U-N-T. We want to count these grades in column N. So we want to count the grades in column N, dollar N, dollar um, five, colon, dollar N, dollar 45. And we want to count them only if the value in those cells is NG or the value in those cells is B53. So we've got none, no NGs, because again, I'm a benevolent lecturer. <laughs> um, and we look up here and we just check to see if we've got any NGs because no zero is always a dodgy result because you think, oh, maybe there's an error there. Maybe I didn't, it wasn't clear enough to catch it. Let's drag it down to all the other ones. So this refers to how many Fs we have. We should have one F. There we go, one, yes. We should have, let's just pick another example, C2. And we should have two of those. There's one. There's yet another. Yeah, that's it. So it seems to be working as well. So now we've got a frequency count. Now that's kind of hard to visualize. Um, so what we would like to do is we'd like to have a diagram maybe of that. So let's um, insert a diagram, recommended chart. So the recommended chart, we've got a few charts. We've got this chart, that, that's quite informative, I think. Um, we might look and we might see pie chart maybe. Uh, no, um, C1, D1, ah, okay. So let's, let's go back, sorry. One thing I forgot to do here was just highlight the data I wanted to chart. So now let's look at the recommended charts and we get this example here, which tells us how many A1s, A2s, B1s, so we could, the university can see if I'm too kind a marker or too harsh a marker. We could do it as a pie chart, but I'm gonna keep it as this sort of chart because I like that. So there's a chart done for us. I'll just stick it beside the data it refers to there. Again, interested in co-locating bits of information that are tied to other bits of information. So that's us mostly there. Um, just a few other things I want to cover, which is the sum product. Now, in this case, it's a silly sum product. Typically, you use this for number of merchandise sold by the price of that merchandise to see how much money is coming in. Here, I'm just going to say the, the mark by the frequency to give a sort of maximal total score of students. But if this was, you know, iron jumpers, five sold, um, or iron jumpers, 50 euro, um, then we could do a better sum product. Okay, so sum product. Uh, so we're going to multiply A53 by B53, A54 by B54. So we've got to put in the first array, which is A53 to A64 by B53 to B54. Obviously got that wrong somewhere. Um, ah, sorry, C53, C54. There we go. So that gives us that multiplied by that, plus that multiplied by that, plus that multiplied by that. And you can see how that would be useful in the more business context. A few things I haven't done yet are hide and filter. So when I'm putting in the grades, I obviously don't want to keep all this stuff in the middle this interim stuff I've got, I just want to see the student and the grade. 
So I can just highlight the cells and hide them. And that makes it very easy to see that Tom, Mike got a C1, Tom got a D1, Grace got a C1. And then I can unhide them when I'm done again. Sorry, I missed the cell. There we go. Um, filter. Filter is kind of interesting. So, and I'm going to show two things here. I'm going to show how you find stuff that you can't quite remember. So I'm going to, I want to filter so that only the, only the digital media students or the computer students come up. So I'm going to type in filter here because that's what I want to do. Add or remove filters and it's done it for me. So now I don't have to select all. I can just select computer science students. And I just see the computer science students or I can select computer science and the digital media students and just get those, or just the digital media students. That's kind of uh, good as well. And if I want to remove the filter, I just type in filter again. And add or remove filters, it will remove the filter for me. And um, now you probably heard a bit about pivot tables and pivot tables are kind of cool because they allow you to slice and dice the data in numerous ways that, you, that isn't really possible on the main table. So, or is possible, but with greater effort. To show you pivot tables, I'm going to have to uh, do a, well, actually I'll show you pivot tables um, and show you the problems you typically come across with them. So, the, five, to, and just I'm only interested to grade, so I'm interested in L45, and I get this error. Um, pivot tables hate blank data. They hate blank data in the headers and in the data. So what you got to do if you're going to use pivot tables is destroy our spreadsheet a little. Uh, we're going to get rid of that, delete this because this is considered a header, so we delete that. And now we see that all headers have a value in them. Column H is blank, so pivot tables don't like that. So we're going to remove that. And in fact, this student who didn't do the first two exams, I'm going to have to fill in that value now. I should be able to do it. So let's just highlight what I want to take. And just do pivot. I get the pivot chart. This time it should give me the right values. Uh, so it's D3, well, I suppose we can use the headers, yeah, okay. And you'll see that the default is to make a new worksheet. But we're gonna go out of that worksheet and create a new worksheet. So here we got a strange looking uh, spreadsheet, but what I want to see is I want to see the values of total marks by course. And you see that games did best in it, computer systems did okay in it, media tech next and digital media last. Uh, that's by columns. Um, so, and you can put filters on that. Now it doesn't make any sense to put filters on the data that I have in there, um, but uh, I, I, it shows the point and it shows the power of spreadsheets. So let's go back to our main sheet. Um, I think that's it. Uh, shall we take another two seconds pause? Okay, so welcome back. Um, this is just my last slide and I just wanted to give you some sort of cues or some hints as you might, how you might um, apply good error checking practice in your spreadsheets. Uh, so let's get out of that mode. And let's bring up the spreadsheet again. Okay, so one thing you'll notice is that when I click on something like this, I get the formula, but I also get the cells it refers to. And that would have saved me several times when I made mistakes in when I was creating the spreadsheet. It shows that I refer to the final exam result out of 65, the midterm out of 15, and the practical out of 20, which is exactly what I wanted. Sometimes I ignored the wrong data I was giving me. It was showing, I ignored the data it was giving me when I typed in the wrong references and cells. So it's always good to check these. Okay, back to it. Okay, so software engineering practice. Um, 
what's good, what's deemed as good testing practice in software engineering is that you define your inputs and expected outputs manually before you run them through the program or before you run them through the spreadsheet. So the idea here is I, I, I don't have any of this calculated. I, I type in three random values here and I work out what the midterm result should be. So I say seven, okay, that should be three and a half and I divide it. I take out a calculator and I figure out what 50.5 should be. I figure out it's 32.85 and then I add this, this and this together and I figure out that should be 55. Um, that 55 then, I, I look at my grade table and I say, okay, that should be a C1 and only then do I check if it's a C1. So I work out all this manually before I am um, before I look at the results that come out of the spreadsheet. The problem here is that people tend to match the results they've got with their expectations if they, if they do it the other way. If you, if you see you've got a C1, you sort of look to ratify that C1 to say the C1 is correct. If you do it manually, you've got a totally independent create, set of results created that then you can check off objectively against your spreadsheet. Okay. Um, you should design your test cases so that they are at the edge of conditions. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at our grades here, this is a good example. 40, it's just a C1, sorry, a C3. And if I got 39, it should be a D1. But because it's trickled over into 40, it's C3. So we're checking the very boundary of the C3 condition. We should have another check case, case that tests 39. Likewise, we should have another test case that checks 47 and 48 because that's the boundary of a C2. So you should check at the extremes. Um, beware the green markers. They report an inconsistency which should probably be commented on or checked. So where have we got green? We've got, we had a green marker here because it didn't refer to the adjacent cell, but we were happy enough with that. But it, those green markers that Excel comes up with, they're, they're quite good to indicate where errors might be. Um, based on the studies we did with um, spreadsheet errors, um, common bottom line errors are inaccurate references. So referencing other cells and them being the wrong cell. So if you double click here on a cell, you see that it's a VLOOKUP based on K42. So that is that particular student's mark. So that's right. And based on this table here. So that's right. So you get a lot of data in there in terms of the color coding that shows that you're referencing the right cells. Um, missing input values. So that's another very common um, problem with spreadsheets where um, you might remember we were missing this value and this value. And if we kept the same formula for him for total marks as we did for everyone else, he would have got a result of 29.5 rather than 45. Because he had a six cert, he, um, he was totally marked in his final exam. And that in this case is the difference between a C3 and an F. So um, that will be an important distinction. Um, so typically you should put in a comment um, marked only because um, six or for midterm. Incorrect formula. Um, so what I've tried to do here is I've tried to make my formula quite simple. You can see that this is the most complex it got. Sum nested by a roundup. Um, so you do the sum first and then you round it up to the nearest whole, whole number. Um, that's a, probably as complicated as formulas should get. If you do read the Crawl and Butler paper that I, I highlighted to you earlier in the presentation, you'll see that um, a very complex formulas in there that actually introduced errors in the spreadsheet. And finally, record who takes the spreadsheet off you. You'll typically send it around by email, but if you do send it around on a USB stick or something like that, if you find an error later on, you'll need that information so that those people can fix that spreadsheet as well. 
Okay, so that's it. Um